So welcome everyone to today's seminar titled Synergy of High Performance Computing in Nuclear Physics to Resolve Long Longstanding Puzzles, the Proton Spin and Mass. Our speaker today is Dr. Martha Costandino, who is an assistant professor of physics at University of Temple in Philadelphia, USA. Martha received her bachelor and doctoral degree from the Department of Physics of the University of Cyprus. In 2012, she was a visiting lecturer at the University of Cyprus and held a postdoc position there, as well as one at Castorcy of the Cyprus Institute. As of 2016, Dr. Costandino is an assistant professor at the internationally renowned University of Temple in Philadelphia, USA. In 2020, she was awarded the Selma Lee Bloch Brown Professorship and is a fellow of the Center for Nuclear Femtography. She's a recipient of the prestigious Early Career Award by the US Department of Energy, and her research focuses on the field of theoretical nuclear physics, particularly in studies of quantum chromodynamics, the fundamental theory, and the strong nuclear force. This interaction links quarks and gluons together to form protons and neutrons, which are the basic structural elements of matter that make up the visible world. Uh, over to you, Martha. Thanks for being our speaker today. Uh, thank you, Stelio, and everyone for the uh, invitation. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's always nice to be back uh, uh, in familiar places. I usually visit once a year, but now with uh, uh, the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, uh, I hope that we'll see you uh, next year. Um, so today I want to talk a bit about uh, 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 recent developments uh, in theoretical nuclear physics uh, that uh, are state of the art uh, and very, very competitive research that uh, would not have been possible uh, without the synergy with um, computational science and HPC. And uh, let me start by thanking my collaborators. Um, uh, many of these names uh, uh, you are uh, familiar with. Uh, they are scientists from the University of Cyprus and the Cyprus Institute. Uh, we are all under the umbrella uh, of the extended twisted mass uh, collaboration. And if you're interested to learn more about our calculations and the computational methods, you can look at these two publications, uh, which are the, the recent ones, but um, they rely on longstanding expertise that was developed in more than a decade. Uh, the outline of my talk uh, includes uh, some introduction, motivation, and, uh, and some uh, uh, brief uh, explanations of how to understand the structure of fundamental particles uh, from lattice QCD. And uh, physics-wise, I will talk about two topics, the, the proton spin uh, and the proton mass. And just to um, make sure that everybody uh, understands this uh, field of uh, research that I will talk about, this quantum chromodynamic uh, theory, or QCD for short, uh, this is the core of the visible matter. And uh, we all know about the molecules and the atoms that are extensively studied by biology and chemistry. Um, but in nuclear physics and understanding the, the structure of, of the visible matter, one has to go into the subatomic uh, level and study the protons and the neutrons and other fundamental particles that have internal structure. So these are not point-like particles. They do have internal structure. My focus will be the proton, which is one of the most important uh, uh, hadrons. And uh, for this particular particle, we have that, uh, uh, we know that all these uh, uh, fundamental particles uh, under the hadron uh, umbrella, they are made out of quarks and gluons, uh, and they have uh, basically some of these quarks that uh, are responsible for the quantum uh, uh, numbers of the, uh, of the particle, but also there is a sea of particles, uh, namely the C quark and the gluons. So um, 
unlike what we thought 50 years ago, a proton is a very complex uh, uh, particle. It has this very rich uh, and intensive uh, internal structure. So this is what we're trying to understand. We are trying to understand the properties of the proton with respect of its constituents, quarks and gluons that we, we will collectively call partons. So what is quantum chromodynamics? Uh, this is the theory uh, of the strong uh, interaction which holds quarks and gluons uh, together. Uh, it is part of the standard model uh, we, and uh, it, they are part of these uh, fundamental forces of nature. And uh, we have uh, the six flavors of quarks and also the gluons, which are the mediators of the strong force. And one of the characteristics of quantum chromodynamics is that uh, only a few parameters are needed. And these are the quark masses and as well as the, 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 the coupling constant, which uh, is the strength of the, of the interaction. Um, QCD uh, shares similarity with other fundamental theories, such as electromagnetism, um, but it has um, also significant differences that make, make QCD to be a unique theory and more complex than other fundamental uh, um, forces in nature. And one of these is the fact that the coupling constant is not actually constant, but it varies with the energy scale. So in particular, we have that at small distances or high energies, which is this region here, this, the strength of the uh, interaction be between quark and gluons are, is very small. And being so small, it allows, uh, uh, it allows us to use perturbation theory to describe the strong interaction. But if you are at uh, the small energy scales um, below uh, one GV or even uh, five GV in this region here, you see how the strength of the interaction increases and therefore perturbative tools uh, fail. And this is also evident by uh, the so-called uh, flux tube. This is the quark confinement that uh, quarks cannot be observed uh, free in nature. Um, and uh, this is uh, uh, a consequence of the confinement uh, that, var that is uh, uh, varying uh, coupling constant. Uh, so, since we can use perturbation theory here, uh, we have uh, well-defined techniques to describe uh, high energy processes. But for the energy scale that we are interested in, which is the energy scales of, of the proton, this is the region of uh, around 1 GV. And therefore, perturbation theory uh, fails. And there are other methods that have been developed, but uh, the most um, a uh, successful one is lattice QCD, which is basically large scale numerical simulations. And this is what I will talk about uh, today. Uh, the fact that QCD has these uh, novelties, it makes, for example, the mass generation to be a very complex uh, mechanism. Uh, if one studies uh, the hydrogen atom and how it's bound together uh, the, the constituents, electron and proton, we have a, well a, well, uh, a, a good understanding by adding the mass of the constituents and minus a small energy, which is the binding energy to have a stable uh, system of, of the hydrogen. So the mass generation in QED is well defined. But if you try to repeat this exercise for the proton, and naively speaking, one tries to, to compare the energy, uh, the mass of the proton compared to the constituents, uh, uh, valence quarks, one sees a, a, a huge gap between uh, the two. And therefore, uh, this is a, a demonstration that the mass generation uh, in the fundamental particles due to the strong interaction is a much more complicated mechanism than what one sees uh, in electromagnetism. Uh, 
Uh, and, and this is because uh, you don't have an empty space where the quarks exist, but there are uh, inside the QCD vacuum where you have uh, uh, gluons and C quark interacting that affect the mass uh, of uh, the hadrons. Uh, despite the fact that uh, the strong interaction is a very complicated mechanism, uh, the QCD Lagrangian, which is part of the standard model, and it's basically the, the, the set of equations that describe um, the strong interaction, can be written in a very elegant form. However, uh, when uh, you see the degrees of freedom, which are the quark fields and the gluon fields, uh, there are infinite degrees of freedom because out of the vacuum you have generation and annihilation uh, of particles, and therefore you don't have a fixed number of degrees of freedom. So it's a highly nonlinear um, theory, and uh, it cannot be solved analytically, and one requires field theories to uh, address this issue. Uh, there have been theoretical efforts to understand QCD. Uh, in the past, uh, when QCD was first proposed, uh, they were using perturbation theory and models and approximations of the QCD Lagrangian to be able to give some information uh, on, on the proton and other particles. However, I, this has been proven that it's not uh, uh, a good approximation for all energy scales, exactly because the coupling constant is not, oh, is not, it doesn't have a fixed value, but it varies with the energy scale. And uh, in the 80s, the lattice formulation of QCD was proposed, which is an ideal first principle formulation in the sense that one starts from the full QCD Lagrangian, there are no approximations or modeling. Uh, and basically, in it's, the concept is relatively simple. You apply a four-dimensional space-time discretization uh, of, um, of the world uh, uh, around you. And you try to understand how the uh, proton, for example, is, uh, um, is described on a four-dimensional grid. Uh, so this is uh, the basic idea of QCD. One of the advantages is that uh, there is no introduction of new parameters uh, compared to the uh, continuum theory. But what we have, we have now that the, the nearest neighbors have a fixed uh, uh, distance. So there is a discretization applied. And also because this is a numerical um, uh, tool, and needs to be done on, on computers, you have to uh, simulate this on a finite space. So you have the volume of, uh, of the region that you are studying and also uh, the uh, discretization, which gives the distance between the nearest neighbors. Uh, and there have been a, a lot of improvements since the, the proposal of, uh, of Lattice QCD. Now we are able to have uh, distance for the nearest neighbors that are below 0.1 Fermi. And the volume of uh, the simulation has a, an extent in the spatial direction, which is of the order of um, five to six Fermi. So this is large enough to be able to uh, capture the proton size, uh, and the interaction of the partons that uh, help us study the properties of the proton uh, with respect to the partonic degree, degrees of freedom. So uh, how, may, how big is your lattice size? Um, how dense is your lattice? But also, uh, what are the values that you choose for the quark masses? Uh, we know that the, quark mass, the quarks have certain mass in nature, but since we are doing now a numerical formulation, one can use um, any values they like. And we, I will show you some examples on this uh, later today. Um, but the cost of the simulation is controlled by, uh, by fixing these uh, parameters. Uh, and one more thing that is important to mention is that the way one can take a continuum theory and discretize it is not unique. 
And there are many well-defined formulations that have been used uh, over the years. Uh, they have advantages and disadvantages. One of the things that you want to know, for example, is how fast you, you, you converge to the continuum uh, limit, meaning that we take this distance to be uh, zero. And what are the discretization effects? Because eventually you want to simulate as close as possible to nature. Um, and uh, if one uh, performs several simulations at a, at a variety of volumes and at different uh, values of the lattice spacing, one can take this uh, continuum, an infinite volume limit to recover continuum space. And all these discretizations, even though they, they look different, if they're discretized in the continuum limit, they all give the same QCD Lagrangian. Um, so uh, men, talking about the parameters of the simulations and how this control, uh, there are a lot of computational challenges uh, on this type of uh, calculations. In principle, we have billions uh, uh, and if not hundreds of billions of degrees of freedom, which requires a huge computational power, but also at the same time, algorithmic improvements are necessary. And I have here a plot that uh, was developed a few years ago where it shows for a particular operation, what is the, the cost in, in days of this uh, calculation? And you see how this, is, uh, how this uh, uh, cost progressed and reduced as the years progress. And this is because better machines became available that made these calculations much faster. So you see that there is a, a huge slope here uh, decreasing the computational cost. Uh, at the same time though, every time there is a new architecture, there is a lot of effort required to make the software applicable and optimized for these architectures. So if one considers these optimizations due to the combination of new machines and uh, better algorithms, you see that this slope becomes even more steep. And in fact, uh, there is uh, of the order of 100 less cost if one invests the time to uh, uh, improve the algorithms. So that's very important and part of uh, Lattice QCD uh, uh, practitioners, there are those people who are um, heavily invested in uh, code development and uh, algorithmic improvements. And actually, Castor C is, uh, is playing a huge role uh, in this. Uh, so we are now in uh, the Pentascale era. I have here uh, one of the uh, computations, uh, one of the uh, computers that are being used uh, in our calculations is a cyclone that is hosted at Castor C. Um, but we are also looking into moving in the exascale, so supercomputing era that will become available in the next few years. The community is actively working uh, on getting this uh, uh, done uh, as soon as possible. Um, so uh, just a bit of the technical side on why this requires so much computer time and the, why their calculations are very intensive. Uh, since we're talking about uh, field theories, because as I mentioned, we don't have a fixed number of uh, degrees of freedom, and therefore field, the field theory formalism is appropriate to describe QCD. Uh, we start by the path integral formulation proposed by Feynman, uh, in which the degrees of freedom, the quark fields and the gluon fields uh, are uh, present. And we use Monte Carlo techniques to integrate out this field. Uh, one of the characteristic of this uh, path integral is that uh, you have uh, an exponential here with a complex exponent that uh, prevents you from uh, uh, calculating finite quantities. 
And one of the uh, very important techniques that are, have been uh, uh, proposed is the rotation to the so-called Euclidean time, uh, which means that uh, uh, time becomes imaginary, allowing this uh, imaginary phase to become real. And the main benefit of this is that we can use methods from statistical me mechanics to extract uh, estimates on observables and these use uh, techniques that are well uh, defined and uh, on uh, and use um, uh, computational techniques. Oops. Uh, so one of the important aspects of the calculations is uh, the inversion of the so-called fermion matrix, which is a sparse matrix and is evaluated iteratively. Uh, using uh, uh, processes that uh, have been well developed. And uh, this is repeated uh, millions of times in a calculation is the most common operation that we have to do. So it's important to, 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 to be optimized. Uh, and just to go back uh, a bit, I, I talked about the QCD vacuum and um, uh, one has to produce uh, um, representative, representative configurations that uh, of, the, of the gauge fields of the QCD vacuum with probability that follows the QCD theory. And this is done through Markov chain Monte, Monte Carlo process. And uh, this process needs to be repeated uh, of the order of a hundred and a uh, thousand uh, times to control statistical uncertainties in the observables. Uh, the statistics in observable is much higher than that, but uh, it has been proven that producing these configurations uh, up to of the order of a thousand, we can use and utilize other uh, techniques to further increase the statistics which uh, for which the statistical uncertainties, they uh, scale as one over square root of the number of measurements. Uh, so this gives you an idea uh, how large the uh, calculation needs to be in order to have control uncertainties. Um, uh, in in state-of-the-art calculations, we have uh, lattice uh, volumes that have uh, typically between 64 lattice points to 96 lattice points in the uh, x, y, z direction. Uh, and for the time direction, we have uh, double uh, the, the lattice points. And if you uh, consider all the uh, grid points from these uh, lattice sizes, you get of the order of 10 million to 100 of million of lattice points. And this, um, it's, uh, it's an evident that uh, high performance computing and parallel programming is really necessary to perform this kind of calculations. Uh, they cannot be done uh, on, on traditional uh, uh, computers, uh, like desktop computers or small cl clusters, in particular to generate state-of-the-art uh, configurations of about uh, 500, you need uh, uh, 100 million GPU hours, uh, more or less. And for observables, you need additional 10, 10, mini, 10 million uh, uh, GPU hours to get 10,000 inversions. Um, so uh, the HPC and lattice QCD are uh, interwined and uh, one needs to uh, take synergistically the two fields. Uh, in fact, the lattice QCD has been recognized as a transformative field and uh, shapes the development of new computer architecture because it's very demanding uh, and uh, it's something that it's an application that is uh, uh, always considered when developing new computers. Uh, and I want to emphasize that uh, uh, Castor C of uh, Cypress Institute is uh, spearheading the uh, heading this, the software development that is used by our wider collaboration, the ETMC or Extended Twisted Mass Collaboration. 
And this is done through several initiatives to uh, attract funding, for example, and also uh, scientists that are experts, not only in nuclear physics, but also in computer science. And there have been important uh, projects such as the HPC Lib that was funded by the EU Horizon and also the PRAISE uh, initiative uh, where Castor C is the national representative uh, in Cyprus. A another, uh, another efforts that uh, are synergistic with uh, computer scientists to be able to make progress in, um, in software development so we can extract the physics that we, we are after. Um, and uh, one of the things that was developed through this initiative uh, is uh, the multi-grid multi solver to speed up the calculation of the inversion. And I have here a representative calculation showing how um, other techniques uh, have a computational cost in core hours, which is much, much higher than this uh, multi-grid multi uh, solver. Uh, so, uh, this is a very important development and it's being used um, um, by all the ETMC members regardless of the physics project they are doing and uh, this allows uh, our collaboration to be worldwide leaders in certain calculations for example for proton structure. Uh, so uh, I want to emphasize one, once again that um, being uh, up to date with the computer architecture that is available uh, and the state of the art machinery is very important. Uh, and again, another example I have here to show uh, what is the cost of, of uh, producing this gauge configuration is um, based on the architecture. So the different colors you see here are different machinery. Uh, the earliest one is 2015, where you see uh, where is a computational cost uh, and how this significantly drops uh, with, um, uh, because of this uh, architecture, uh, we went from uh, one machinery to a different one uh, still, this is CPU architecture and the use of the multi-grid, for example, uh, it reduces the computational cost by at least an order uh, of magnitude. Uh, so it's important to uh, have uh, always uh, synergy with uh, uh, computer uh, architecture and computer scientists that help us uh, better optimize uh, our applications. All right, so uh, with all these uh, improvements and, and, the, and the methods that are being developed, we are able to address um, um, state-of-the-art questions uh, in nuclear physics. Uh, I want to highlight two questions, which uh, you see here. Uh, these are questions that have been uh, posed by the National Academies of Science and Engineering uh, by, of, of the uh, United States. Uh, there has been an initiative for more than a decade now of a new experimental facility to be built. This is an electron ion collider. Um, and uh, recently, the academies have put an assessment on the, on the physics uh, 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 that the EIC will be able to address. And two of these questions is uh, what, uh, what is the uh, mass generation of, uh, the, of the proton, but also what is the spin decomposition uh, of the proton? And uh, very recently, actually less than two weeks, uh, we put out together the so-called EIC yellow report because the EIC, which is uh, a billion dollar uh, uh, facility, uh, received the green light and the funding from the Department of Energy to be built at Brookhaven National Lab in the US. So the uh, worldwide community in nuclear physics is working on, uh, on pushing the science of QCD and, and may, uh, understanding the requirements of the detectors to be able to uh, address the physics that we are after. 
And this is uh, uh, the yellow report we put out uh, very recently. It's a nine, 900 pages document that uh, uh, with co-authors from uh, more than 150 institutions. And actually Lattice QCD is featured in the yellow report. And um, the message given is that Lattice QCD can provide valuable input in understanding some of these fundamental uh, uh, questions posed by um, uh, the EIC. Uh, so how do we st study hadron structure? Um, uh, we do this experimentally by high energy scattering processes like deep inelastic scattering. Um, and this is because at high energies, uh, remember I mentioned that the, uh, the coupling constant of the strong force is very small, and therefore we use what the so-called asymptotic freedom property of QCD, where the cross-section of such a process is separated into two pieces, a perturbative piece and a non-perturbative piece where uh, gives information of the hadron that participates in this process. In this case, we are talking about protons. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this part here gives information about, for example, how the, the quarks and gluons are distributed inside uh, the proton, what is the momentum that are carrying uh, in, during uh, this process. Uh, so these are the so-called distribution functions, uh, and there are three types, are the pattern distribution functions and their generalizations called GPDs and TMDs in short. Um, for the purpose of this talk, uh, which is about the spin and the mass, I will only uh, need to refer to PDFs. And um, all these experimental high energy processes are summarized uh, in these plots. Uh, where you see uh, the data points uh, showing what, how many data are available, experimental data sets are available, different colors correspond to different experiments, and eventually uh, theories take this uh, data, they apply the so-called um, global fits to extract uh, the distribution functions which tell, which tell us how the pardons inside the protons behave during uh, these processes. And you have uh, quantities that are very well defined because you have uh, a huge number of data uh, of the order of a thousand. But if you look at some other processes and other quantities, you see that there are only a few number of data sets here making the extraction of the, uh, of the PDFs to be uh, very unreliable and have high uncertainties. So this is where uh, Lattice QCD can be helpful because for us calculating uh, different uh, type of PDFs, comes at uh, the same uh, difficulty. So we can get uh, this kind of PDFs uh, in, at the same uh, cost as uh, the first one. Uh, so this is something that uh, the, the scientific community is recognizing and is seeking results from the Lattice uh, to help better constrain these quantities. So I talked about calculating observables on the lattice. This is done uh, through correlation functions uh, that uh, have three different uh, diagrams that are shown here pictorially. Uh, in, uh, in summary and in a naive way, you have uh, here a creation of a proton. Uh, it later couples with uh, an operator and this represents the high energy process, the interaction with the current that will reveal the structure of the proton you created and later it annihilates. And because the, this, this uh, interaction can be done uh, with the valence quarks of the proton, the C quarks of the proton or the gluons inside the proton, we have these three different type, uh, types of diagrams. And I want to emphasize that because of computational challenges, 
Uh, for a long time, we were able to calculate only the contributions of the valence quarks uh, inside the proton. Uh, there were some uh, uh, works that, that they were assuming that the C quark and the gluon contributions to the various quantities such as the spin and the mass are very small, but that was actually wrong. And it was uh, changed in the last five years when we are able to do state of the art calculations um, uh, of physical quantities. So that's very important. It, it has really changed the, not only the landscape of lattice QCD calculations, but it also helped in uh, lattice QCD becoming a reliable tool that um, experimentalists and theorists uh, refer to. Uh, so the reason that these uh, have not been studied uh, is uh, not just the fact that computationally are extremely challenging. The, the calculations require at least an order of magnitude more statistics and therefore more computational resources to get similar statistical uncertainties with the uh, valence quark contributions. And uh, so in our calculations, we do this, uh, calcul this correlation functions with different operator here uh, that give different part of the, spa of, the, of the spin and the mass. And here, just in a nutshell, uh, I have uh, the, the, the steps to extract physical quantities. They're very laborious computationally, especially with the fact that we need to extract a large number of data sets um, by uh, taking the creation and annihilation points of the proton to be at a safe distance, safe time uh, separation in order to be able to uh, establish ground states. And that's why you see different colors here. So each, each set of colors corresponds to a completely different calculation, which uh, as many colors as you see, uh, that's the factor of more computational resources required compared to getting only one uh, separation. Uh, I have here a summary of uh, our uh, results, uh, our calculation for all the diagrams. I am not going to go into details. Uh, the, uh, what I will mention is that depending uh, on the time separation that you have between the initial and final state of the proton, which is shown by this uh, number here, you require more statistics because the signal decays exponentially uh, with this time separation. Um, we have many ensembles uh, of gauge configurations. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the lattice uh, spacing is less than 0.1 Fermi, which helps re reduce uh, discretization effects. And the volume has ex a spatial extent between uh, around five uh, Fermi. Um, and we use all these ensembles and different operators to get information on, on the spin. So we do know the spin of the, uh, of the proton is one half. Uh, we learned this early on in our undergraduate uh, studies. But in, in 1988, it was found in one of these uh, uh, high energy experiments that uh, when they calculated uh, the, uh, the valence quark contribution to the spin, it was found to be very small. Uh, and that was, that was unexpected because based on simple models, they, they thought that uh, each one of the three quarks that the uh, proton comprises uh, from uh, they um, uh, correspond to one third of the spin, but that's not the case. Uh, it, that was called the, the so-called spin puzzle and uh, many theoretical studies uh, were initiated after that to understand where is the missing part of the, of the, of the proton. And also many more experiments were um, discussed to find the missing piece. And we have now recent results by one of the experimental collaborations, the STAR collaboration, uh, that uh, has shown that it is naive to assume, to, to neglect the complex structure uh, of the pl proton. And one has to take into account the, uh, the CQR contribution and the gluon contribution. 
So uh, this is an important calculation for the lattice because we are able to use uh, our techniques to uh, find the decomposition of the one half of the, of the proton. They are well-defined operators that we can calculate on the lattice. And by uh, adding them together, the, the test that we need to uh, see is what is uh, the total spin and does it uh, sum up to, uh, to one half. Um, so these are quantities that have been studied for um, uh, more than 15 years now. And you see here a history a diagram basically uh, where we have started, the community started with an unrealistic calculations, assuming that we live in a world where the particles are much, much heavier than what actually in nature are. And that was uh, a necessary um, thing to do because the computational methods and the uh, computer architectures were not advanced enough to simulate the, uh, the, the nature uh, values, which is shown uh, here in these points. Um, so in the last uh, five years, approximately, we are able to simulate directly at uh, uh, physical parameters. And uh, this is a huge advantage of the field that made it more reliable. Uh, and you see here a collection of data to understand how this has progressed uh, over the years. Uh, in this plot, you can see some recent results on the intrinsic spin by our collaboration uh, compared to uh, other collaborations. And uh, uh, we have, um, uh, in, in for, compared to other cases, uh, reduce uncertainties, which is thanks to uh, the algorithmic improvements that uh, um, uh, have been applied. Uh, okay, let me move on. Uh, I don't think I have uh, much time left. Uh, so another quantity that enters a spin, for example, is the momentum carried by the partons uh, in relation with the momentum of the proton. And I want to emphasize uh, our results, the, the red points, compared to experimental data analysis, the black points, and also with other collaboration, which is shown here uh, with blue. And you see that our red point is uh, not only compatible with the values extracted from experiments, but also the, the uncertainties we have are much less compared to other lattice group, which uh, makes uh, our calculations to be a very competitive and a reference point by, point by experimentalists. And uh, as one would expect, if each parton is car carrying a certain uh, par a certain percentage of the of the proton's momentum. If you add all of these contributions together, you expect to get a uh, hundred uh, percent, which is what we find. So this is uh, another cross check in our calculations and uh, and the correctness of our methods that uh, uh, this comes naturally to be a hundred percent. Uh, so I, I'm going to skip this. This is a collection of the final results coming from the three different uh, diagrams, which includes the valence quarks, the C quarks, and also the gluon contributions. Uh, you need all of them uh, to extract uh, the total spin. Uh, and these kind of calculations have been pursued for a long time, and it's only now that we are able to uh, address all of them. And I have here a, con a collection of, of, of our data. I don't, need, I don't want to go into the numbers simply because uh, this is not a, a physics seminar, but what I want to emphasize is that the quark contributions uh, put together gives this magenta uh, uh, part here. And also the gluons, if added, they give this contribution. And what we find is that um, the, in a proton, around 60% of its momentum is being carried by the quarks and around 40% of its momentum 
so of its sorry not momentum spin in this case of its spin is being carried by the gluons and therefore what uh, the, the the so called spin puzzle is uh, uh, there is no puzzle uh, uh, anymore to consider because we cannot neglect any of this contribution and expect to find one half but if all these contributions were added uh, together, you do get that indeed the, the proton spin is one half, and this is done from first principle uh, lattice QCD calculation. So that was a big success uh, in the community. Uh, we This is the second paper we have on the spin. The first one was accepted in physical review letters. And uh, members of our group have, have given dozens of uh, invited talks, uh, especially for this topic, because uh, the experimentalists were interested to see uh, these results and how the spin is decomposes. Um, and uh, what I want to emphasize again is that uh, the scientists have used this result to draw a better picture of the proton. This is a pictorial way, but based on our results and whether are negative or positive, uh, they were able to draw the directions uh, of the orbital angular momentum uh, for the quarks. So that's uh, very rewarding to see us uh, lattice QCD practitioners going from, um, uh, from an era where we were trying to understand all our uncertainties uh, into an era where experimentalists rely on our results to have a better understanding uh, of physical quantities, but also to help them uh, develop a better experiments uh, and setup. Uh, very quickly, uh, I will uh, talk about the proton mass, uh, which uh, for some was thought that this is not a big uh, issue because the proton masses are known. If you do a quick Google search, you will see that, that the proton mass is accurately uh, um, uh, extracted um, by different uh, methodologies and has a well-known value. But when you study hadron structure, you don't care about the total mass, but what you care is about the mechanism that gives rise to this mass. Um, and uh, this is a very complicated question to, to ask. It's even more complicated than trying to understand how much the quarks and gluons contribute to the proton spin. Uh, and this has to do with theoretical uh, challenges that I'm not going to go into. But what we are confident about is that uh, the Higgs mechanism that was uh, uh, discovered experimentally in 2012, and it was expected from the standard model, and it, it was called, it was assumed to be the mechanism that gives, gives rise to the masses. When it comes to understanding the proton mass, the Higgs mechanism, which, which gives mass into the quarks, it's only a fraction of the proton mass, and there is more to the proton mass than uh, the Higgs mechanism. And again, this has to do that we are in an energy scale where uh, the mass and the energy are interchangeable. So energy in, 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 in the system arises our, uh, our mass. Uh, there are more than one ways, ways to understand this, uh, uh, the, the mass decomposition. In, in summary, you do a series of calculations of different components, and if you sum them together, you get the total mass. We are not after trying to get the total mass. This is known, but we are after to understand what is the various uh, contributions, which based on a theoretical work, uh, it was understood that the total proton mass is made out of the Higgs mechanism, meaning the quark masses, uh, the energy of the quarks, uh, also the gluon energy, and another contribution, the so-called trace anomaly, which is unique for theories like uh, uh, QCD. 
Uh, and for a long time, uh, people have been asking if one can calculate the mass distribution uh, into the nucleon. And the answer is uh, yes. Uh, there are well-defined operators that we can calculate on the lattice. There are some challenges to get uh, the, 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 uh, the last one, which seems to be unrealistic at the moment, but we do have uh, ways to get information about the proton mass. Uh, and I am going to use these results that uh, we have uh, put out uh, recently and um, are summarized here. Again, one needs to take into account uh, all the contributions from all the partons inside the, uh, the proton. So such a calculation would not be possible five years ago. Um, but today we have uh, a better understanding of the proton mass. Uh, from the Higgs mechanism, we find from our lattice result this is 20%. The quark energy give a rise to 30%. The gluon energy uh, contribute around 30% into the uh, proton mass. And when it comes to the last contribution, this is extremely challenging and very difficult to calculate, but one can use some other theoretical um, equations, the so-called sum rules, uh, um, which require basically that the sum of these contributions to give rise to the total mass of the proton. So doing that, we can extract the mass budget uh, of the proton, uh, where uh, if added together, we get that uh, indeed the mass uh, is uh, the mass sum rule is satisfied. And now by looking at these contributions, we can have a better understanding of what contributes to the mass of the proton. Uh, and there are more than one ways to uh, give physical interpretation to the quark and gluon contributions to the mass. We have done all of those. And what is important to emphasize is that such detailed understanding, it comes from lattice QCD. It does appear in some models, but models are not complete QCD. Um, but it's not available from experiments. It's expected to be um, uh, experimental data related to the proton mass will come with the EIC, which is in more than a decade from now. So we are in a unique position uh, to provide understanding on hadrons and proton structure in particular from lattice QCD. Uh, so I hope that with uh, these uh, rep representative calculations, uh, uh, you are convinced that uh, we're finally able to address open scientific questions. Uh, in fact, in the last two years, the lattice QCD results are not only being plotted against experimental data for comparison, but are actually used in uh, uh, together with experimental data to reliably extract physical quantities. I have here um, uh, a, a work done by uh, uh, a collaboration that is uh, the Jefferson National Lab collaboration that they obtain these uh, red lines uh, for uh, a quantity related to the spin. But when they used our lattice results, these became the blue points, the blue bands. And you see that there is uh, a significant constraint and reduction in the error um, just because uh, of in including lattice QCD results in their analysis. Uh, very importantly, Lattice QCD plays an important role in the development of new computer art architecture and software. NVIDIA uh, uh, employs uh, Lattice practitioners, and uh, they often uh, give talks about uh, strong scaling HPC applications using Lattice QCD as a case study. Uh, they are in contact with Lattice practitioners to understand our constraints and our needs so we are able to improve our calculations. Uh, in fact, um, uh, there is an initiative uh, from com computational centers funded by national agencies uh, that seek assistance from uh, Lattice QCD uh, people enabled to define the next generation of computers. There are open calls. Uh, we recently submitted together with uh, the Lattice group at uh, Castor C 
uh, a proposal on uh, on for a leadership leadership class computing facility application uh, which is not yet available but they want to work with uh, lattice practitioners to be able to develop uh, um, the next generation of machinery uh, so that's all I had uh, today, and thank you for uh, your time. Um, thank you very much for your talk, Martha. I was wondering, do you have time for questions, or do you have a lecture or something? No, I I, um, I have time. Okay, so I'm sure the, if there's any comments, questions on Martha's talk, then please raise your hands or unmute yourself and talk. Ah, uh, Christoph, go ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, hi, Martha. Thank you for the very interesting, very, very interesting talk. Uh, um, I, I, I know very little about the field, but it's it's really like watching a Christopher Nolan movie that you get super excited and you're not exactly sure why sometimes. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, I, 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 my question is maybe, maybe very basic. It's, it was about not using physical parameters for the for the simulations. What, what I remember from from theory, you use kind of um, uh, natural units, right? Uh, so, uh, in in when you are doing the simulations, is it just a matter of normalization uh, that you don't that you choose different values? No, it's a complicated uh, it's a complicated process of tuning these uh, these quark masses, uh, and and in fact uh, there is uh, a, a, when these uh, gauge configurations are being produced, uh, there is a period of trial and error. Uh, of course, the expertise that has been developed so far is is valuable to uh, those developing the configurations. Um, uh, but basically, what is is being done is that you uh, there is an initial, let's say, guess, uh, very simplistic uh, speaking, a guess on the quark masses, and then uh, you generate a few configurations. You calculate the masses uh, of uh, of uh, the the pion, for example, and you see wh how, what is this 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 value. So it's not a matter of normalization. It's a highly nonlinear. Uh, procedure that uh, requires that one, one to tune uh, the quark uh, masses. Uh, uh, now, when it comes to physical and non-physical, just to give you an understanding, the physical uh, uh, mass in nature of the pion is uh, 138 uh, MeV approximately. Uh, 15 years ago, uh, they were not able to, uh, to use this value because it's computationally very costly. So they were assuming that uh, we live in a world where the pion is as heavy as a thousand MeV. We're talking about more than five times heavier than in nature. And as computers became more... Uh, um, uh, 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 better and new, a, a new uh, technology and also improved algorithms, they were able to reduce gradually the pion mass to 500 MeV, 300 MeV, um, but now we are simulating at the physical point, at least our group. There are other groups that uh, they, they find that simulations at physical parameters are very costly and they choose to be away from the physical point, which uh, uh, means that they are susceptible to systematic uncertainties of the calculation, but uh, we are calculating directly at the physical point, but uh, it's an expertise that was uh, gained after more than a decade of simulations. And uh, I don't know, maybe um, uh, there, there are people at, uh, at, at Cyprus Institute that they are, they are uh, they are doing basically this tuning and the generation of configurations. I don't know if they want to add something. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if, if, if I have another question, if, if there is no answer from the people that do this tuning, uh, it's okay, no one pops up. Uh, it's about the, um, um, so you, um, you mentioned that there are, um, so the, uh, the need to do, um, 
to, to use the, the same Monte Carlo simulations where, where, where they are, let's say, numerically expensive um, uh, calculations. Um, is there any uh, thoughts to, to use in the field um, uh, um, th th things that come out of, from, from machine learning, let's say, use uh, guns uh, from, from the deep learning space to, to kind of replace some parts of these costly uh, calculations? Um, uh, I haven't used it personally, but uh, it, it is true that in the last uh, few years, machine learning uh, has been ent has entered lattice QCD and uh, in general nuclear physics. And uh, I know that there are out there calculations uh, uh, on the observables, on getting the observables um, by training uh, the machines with uh, actual data uh, and then, um, you know, using those to, to predict uh, new ones at, at higher, at, at lower cost. Uh, so this is done. Uh, I don't know how much it, it has entered uh, the generation of configurations, which is uh, very costly, but I know that um, uh, it has entered the, cal the, the calculation of observables, such as the spin, for example. Uh, the, there are people, I have seen some of the results coming from the Cyprus, Inst Cyprus Institute group uh, showing uh, how the, the machines can be trained. So I know they're using uh, the softwares and the uh, uh, all the expertise developed um, uh, locally. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Vangelis, you have a question? Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Telios. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. It was very, very nice, very exciting, the, the whole presentation. I really think we all learn uh, a lot of stuff, uh, especially uh, we, we, we are not in the field. I'm just wondering, uh, let's say a little bit more technical question. So if I understand the main problem or the main issue is the sampling problem, right? Sampling problem. So in this case, you create or you use some uh, Markov chain based Monte Carlo methods. Mm -hmm. Is this a metropolis like uh, algorithm? Uh, is it a different type of Markov chain? And how do you... Uh -huh. What's the new proposal? I'm just trying to understand what's the. Yeah, the... I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I cannot answer this question because I am not involved in the generation of configurations. But maybe I don't know if Jacob is here. Maybe he can say because he's one of the people who are doing the generation of configurations. So Jacob, uh, if you are here, feel free to to respond uh, respond on this. Wait, I think Jacob is not here. This is Yanis. Go ahead, Yanis. I was going to say that. Go ahead. Uh, Vangeli, I mean, there is, a, there is a, a, an algorithm to, to, gem, to, to propose the next um, sample, let's say, in the Markov chain, mm -hmm. which is based on a hybrid Monte Carlo, or that's, I think you might find it called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Okay. Okay, but at the end, yes, there is a metropolis accept reject step to correct for uh, some, uh, uh, let's say, to, to, to ensure, let's say, that the proposal is within the required distribution. So, so at the end, there is a metropolis accept reject step, but the proposal is uh, based on some um, um, algorithm like hybrid Monte Carlo or, or Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Okay. Uh, which which uh, which basically does a global proposal of a new configuration. Okay. So my so, question is exactly a bit how do you propose this global? Because this is something that is used also in our field. Eh? Because again, we have such sampling, let's say, problems, and it's always challenging. It's a rather difficult issue to find the proper proposal rule when you apply such. It's not at least in our okay. case. Uh, it's not a trivial issue. Yeah, in our case, we basically treat, uh, in this Hamiltonian Monte Carlo approach, we treat the action, which is the thing in the exponent that we want to sample from, we treat that action as a potential term and introduce new variables, which uh, make up like a kinematic term. And then we evolve this combined 
new Hamiltonian so that the energy remains constant. Okay. All right. I mean, we can sit up, we, we can probably discuss this yeah. offline exactly how we do it, but that's that's sort of, I just tried that's, to sketch out how curiosity. we Yes, yeah. so I think I understand. I mean, in our case, we also have some algorithms that are hybrid molecular dynamics Monte Carlo, where you get some such issues. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks, but we can we can discuss later. Another thing, Martha, which is like, maybe it's very naive this question, but I, I mean, it seems that uh, as, as exactly as you said, when you, as the computational power is increased, then you are now able to to work even in the physical limit. Mm -hmm. So let's say you, know, you work clearly the actual mass. So is there do do you see an end in this rule in this road? I mean, that at some point you will be able, let's say, to fully uh, work on that. So. Uh, I, I, I mean, you know, the discretization will be as detailed as you would like in order to have the proper accuracy. So then you would be, let's say, possible, I mean, to, to answer all these questions. So. Yeah, so we we just got news uh, from uh, one of the, the, from the National Science Foundation uh, that we wrote a proposal with uh, Dina and Yanis uh, and others to generate the uh, con configurations. And actually, we are able to simulate with uh, a, a larger volume, having uh, not uh, 64, which is becoming more traditional, but to have 96 lattice points in each, in, in each XYZ direction and double that for the time uh, direction. Uh, and in fact, the lattice spacing for this is half than what was what we used to do three years ago. Uh, it's we 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 used to do around 0 0.09 Fermi, and now it's dropped to 0 0.056 uh, Fermi. So yes, there are, there are going to be always these uh, improvements that uh, they don't seem huge. So now we're not talking about going to the physical point for more than for for since I started in this field and uh, uh, for a, a decade or so we have been talking about going to the physical point and reaching physical pi on mass. Now we have achieved that and we try to understand and eliminate other systematics such as, as you said, discretization effects. We need to make sure that uh, not important information is lost because the distance between the nearest neighbors is, is large, is large. And so we are able to do that, but there are other issues and that's why the development of the exascale uh, machinery is not trivial. I am not involved in that um, uh, directly, so I cannot give details, but, uh, but one of the things that, uh, that worry the community is that we spend a lot of time developing new machines that speed up the calculation uh, and we were not worrying about the time required to write the data, but now you reach a point where the calculations became so fast that writing, producing and writing is very competitive and there is a limit of what we can do next. And that's why there is now uh, discussion about uh, entering uh, the quantum computing era also for, uh, for nuclear physics. Uh, uh, it's very uh, preliminary and it's really at its infancy, this field. Uh, but all I'm trying to say is that there, the, the limit is not the sky. You have to, uh, there are limitations because of uh, how the operations uh, uh, are performed, but there are other ideas by the community such as quantum computing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if I may ask one one last let's say point, so it's you discuss also uh, error let's say quantification. So do you consider or do you consider statistical methods, statistical approaches in order to to quantify error variance? I mean, I should yeah, so even even simple low ones like bootstrap, jackknife. And yes, we are primarily we're using jackknife. Which takes care of the uh, of the variance and the and the bias, um, but in some cases 
it's uh, the estimation of the error is not appropriate depending on what what you're trying to do and if you try to uh, if you try to combine um, data that have been produced on different samples or different number of configurations a bootstrap analysis is preferred in some of the cases but primarily we're using jackknife okay thank you very much again Okay, Stelios, if I may, do we still have time? Do we still have time? If Martha has time, then yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, thanks very much, Martha. It's very nice to have you with us again. Uh, it's been uh, very nice. Um, now, one thing that, um, um, you know, uh, Christos asked, and I want to um, uh, share some developments is, um, you know, one of the problems going to smaller lattice spacings, Vangeli, is uh, critical slow slowdown. So the autocorrelations uh, grow exponentially, and, and this is a problem uh, that um, hinder us for from you know simulating uh, to very very small lattice spacings. Um, so there are some ideas around to use machine learning to speed up or eliminate uh, autocorrelation. Um, we are trying this for simple models uh, first. Uh, we don't know if it's going to work. This is a, a very exciting new, new direction uh, that may help us. Um, of course, Martha already mentioned quantum computing. Some some people here at the Cyber Institute are trying to, um, you know, write algorithms uh, for uh, quantum systems. Uh, but but I think that's just, just sorry for something the that is very far off at the moment, uh, Vangelis. Uh, I don't I don't know when uh, we, will, we will be able to simulate the light specificity, but it's a very promising direction, as Martha said. But do you need something? to go in smaller lattices? I'm just wondering, you might not need it. I mean, uh, from what the data that I've seen from Martha, you have already very, very good agreement. I mean, it's, do you need to go smaller? Sure, sure, but uh, the, uh, yeah, but uh, taking the continuum limit, uh, you know, I mean- Martha I know, but you never, you never reach the zero. I mean, cannot be zero. So if, let's say, as we say mathematically, if the integral has been, con if converts, if you see convergence, with a, a given accuracy, then uh, you are already... It depends also on the quantities you're studying. So maybe for these quantities, we haven't seen any discretization effects, um, uh, but for other quantities, discretization effects become more important. So it's not only for, for, for these type of calculations. And the other thing is that we are also trying to compare with other formulations. I mean, uh, other other kind of discretizations. You, the, the, the comparison in principle has to be done after, uh, after the, taking the continuum limit. And if I may say, uh, in, in more recent years where I, I was able to see more closely what experimentalists are doing in their analysis and what assumptions they are doing, uh, the lattice QCD do an excellent, the practitioners do an excellent job in trying to be honest and uh, estimate all their systematics. And we are, we are the ones that really need to reach this goal because this is where we want to be. We want to understand all the systematics. And one of these is uh, volume effects, which is pre are present for some quantities and discretization effects, which is present in others. Otherwise, there will always be this uh, lingering uh, uh, idea that lattice is not uh, uh, where it should be. Yeah, Martha, one thing that I wanted to say is that you did not mention anything about renormalization, where you have contributed really enormously. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, right, so this is an issue that uh, we have to face in quantum field theories and uh, of course uh, Martha has been pioneering together with other people at the University of Cyprus uh, the renormalization issue, uh, which is a very complicated one on the lattice. Um, 
And uh, actually, this is one of the things that uh, does not allow us to calculate what Martha called the trace anomaly. Uh, so I don't know, Martha, if you want to, if you have uh, anything to say on that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, as you said, the Cyprus, uh, the University of Cyprus uh, has the expertise. Uh, I got my PhD under the supervision of uh, Haris Panagopoulos, and uh, it was all about uh, renormalization in lattice perturbation theory. Uh, so this is one of the components in lattice calculations that without it, you cannot compare uh, to physical, you cannot extract physical quantity. There are some exce exceptions that of quantities that uh, correspond to conserved currents and doesn't don't require um, renormalization. But uh, this is really exceptional, and most of the quantities we we need to do we need to renormalize. So this is a separate calculation. Uh, the computation, the computational cost in most cases is is small compared to uh, the extracting the uh, the uh, the operator the correlation functions uh, but it could be of the order of a, of a few million compared to i don't know 10 million uh, depending on what you're trying to do if you're trying to renormalize gluonic quantities that's more more laborious um, and so in, in many cases, this is, uh, uh, which is done computationally, it's relatively uh, straightforward, but there are calculations that are very complicated because you, you, you try to calculate two operators or more than two operators, and you know that the, the two, uh, they mix with each other. So when you calculate a correlation function, it's a mixture of two different observables and you need to disentangle those. To be able to do that, you need uh, uh, a mixing matrix to calculate that has uh, N by N components where N is the number of operators that are mixing. So for the trace anomaly, we have a total of uh, the whole trace uh, um, for the whole set of operators involved in the mass is a 10 by 10 <laughs> mixing matrix. So, and some of these uh, data are very difficult to calculate because uh, they are suppressed in signal. Uh, to be able to renormalize reliably, you need to do it non perturbatively. Uh, and that's a whole different uh, story trying to uh, disentangle the physical quantities. We have done so by utilizing both perturbation theory that uh, we have calculated together with Harris for the spin, for example, but these more recently evolved in uh, uh, non-perturbative calculations and some use of perturbation theory uh, so um, it's it's a very difficult type of uh, of calculation too, um, but it's more conceptually difficult than requiring you know software development. The problem is not in software development, in my opinion. Um, okay, thank you, Martha. Any other questions for Dr. Bostandil? I, I have one question if we have. Uh, Go ahead, uh, yes. So um, um, I was curious about the, uh, the I think is your last uh, section in the conclusions uh, about that NVIDIA is using uh, is as test case lattice QCMD to develop a new computer architecture. So could you uh, give some comments, let's say on, Mm -hmm. What 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 an art architecture will would have as advantage compared to what currently exists and would help uh, choosing the lattice choosing the yes so uh, maybe uh, what they're trying to do is just to to develop new uh, and better graphic cards. Uh, and they have people like Kate Clark, we, who is uh, now it's part time. She used to be full time uh, lattice uh, practitioner, but now is part time. 
And uh, NVIDIA has developed uh, a, a set of uh, software, the CUDA, uh, which is appropriate for uh, GPU applications. Uh, and they have now an, ex an extension which is dedicated to Lattice QCD, the CUDA. Um, and uh, there, these are uh, shared openly with the community, and uh, there are lattice practitioners that help to uh, uh, to optimize these packages. And I know that uh, uh, people from Cypress Institute have been working on on these uh, to. Uh, um, uh, enhance this application for this package, the CUDA package with uh, things that uh, we are interested in or use some, ex some extensions uh, of CUDA. Uh, so of course the, the benefit for them is that uh, they have uh, customers to purchase their uh, NVIDIA graphic cards and um, build ca clusters around this. So that's the main idea. So it's, it's similar to what computations happens for graphics, the computation that- Yes, that, yes, this is specifically for uh, GPUs, uh, GPU clusters. So most in, in for deep learning applications, like uh, some advantages of the architectures are on reduced precision, but for QCD precision is an important thing because of the discretization, right? So in computations you are you 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 can be flexible with uh, precision of the floating point point precision or 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 not um i am not sure uh, I, yes, I, I, I don't. That's that is not a problem. The, the the reason why you need the the GPUs is to is to speed up the calculation. Uh, uh, in particular, when when you try to calculate how much the gluons, which are uh, C contributions, um, uh, how much the gluons contribute to quantities you're interested in. Um, you need to have uh, an order of statistics, which is of the order of, uh, uh, let's say, half a million uh, measurements. And each measurement, it's a set of, uh, 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 of laborious calculations. So you want to be able to do this fast. Uh, and that's uh, why GPUs are very useful uh, for us. Is just to optimize and speed up the calculation. But then you, what you need, you need people who are going to be dedicated working on this. Uh, uh, people like uh, Kiriakos Hajiyanagu, who is uh, now at the Cyprus Institute and University of Cyprus, who are spending a lot of time trying to uh, adapt all our codes into GPU architecture, which is not, uh, something that comes uh, ready to use, but uh, the practitioners have to optimize. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, and thank you for the talk. Thank you. Okay, so are there any final questions for Martha? Um, I can't see any, so I would like to thank you very much, Martha, for your talk today. Uh, we hope to see you here at Castor C as soon as possible, as soon as safely possible. Um, thanks again, and everyone, we will see you in the next uh, seminar. So bye for now, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.